Report. Okay, we're being recorded. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Bishop, for accepting your invitation for our talk. We're excited to listen to you talking about stable projection list for Linux. Go for it. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So I'll um, just get right to it. So I um, thought I would tell you about some recent joint work with Alessandro Tignati. Um, so just a little bit of background. So the background, the setting is, is model theory, and I, I don't know all that much about model theory, but you know, model theorists, I guess, study different interpretations for whatever language they're interested in. And uh, Fresse limits, um, a Fresse limit is a way of studying what are more commonly called these days generic objects. Um, so these are infinite structures and they are built up in a systematic way from the finite substructures. Um, so what I've written here is uh, continuous model theory for metric structures. So that's because, um, so the, the particular language that I'm going to be talking about is language of C-star algebras, more specifically tracial C-star algebras, C-star algebras with a uh, tracial state, and maybe the word separable needs to be there somewhere. Um, so originally, Fresse theory was, as I said, um, I guess, studying countable infinite structures by finite substructures. And the, so the, the kind of key example is the Rado graph, if you, if you know what that is. Uh, but to cover um, certain metric structures like the pseudo arc or the, uh, this uh, Gray banach space or the Paulson simplex, um, this kind of discrete Fresse theory was adapted to the metric setting. Okay, so and it'll cover these. Um, so two specific press elements I'm going to be telling you about these uh, stable projections, um, C star algebras that happen to be that we construct to be Fresse limits. Okay, so the language is tracial C star algebras, and um, we're going to be talking about uh, what's called an L category. So a collection of finitely generated tracial C star algebras and a collection of um, morphisms between uh, these objects. So very soon, I'll focus on some very, uh, very specific uh, finitely generated tracial C star algebras and some very specific star homomorphisms between them. Um, so, uh, Fresse limit is a certain kind of um, inductive limit that's built out of uh, this L category. And the, the theorem, which I'll show you on the next slide, is that um, this Fresse limit, which I have yet to define. Um, exists precisely when the category is a so-called Fresse category. So Fresse category is, you know, these objects and morphisms, and these four properties have to be satisfied. So the Cauchy continuity property, which is automatic for this language that we're going to be um, fixed with. So I will not comment on that any further, uh, but the other three I will uh, discuss. So there's the weak Polish property, the joint embedding property, and the um, sort of the the most crucial one, the near amalgamation property. And so, by the way, so this is the kind of the big difference between the continuous version and the discrete version. Um, in, the, in the discrete version, you have an actual on the nose amalgamation property. In the metric continuous setting, you have a, a near amalgamation property. I'll come back to that. Okay, so a K structure, a, a fresh element will be a, one of these kind of, uh, what I'm calling a K structure. It is an inductive limit um, with, uh, you know, the objects are in the category and the morphisms are the morphisms, uh, morphisms in the category. And um, it's set so the a Fresse limit will have two properties. It's meant to be K universal, which is that um, every object can be embedded into it, it so called uh, K admissibly embedded. So, what, what, what this K admissible essentially means is this inductive limit, okay, so the objects will be um, C star algebras with tracial states, and the inductive limit, this M at the top there, will also be a C star algebra with a tracial state. And an embedding of an object will just be a trace preserving star homomorphism between them, okay? But uh, so this K admissible means we don't just want to embed into the limit, we want to kind of embed it to a finite stage. Uh, but it, it turns out um, for the specific categories we're talking about, it, it's equivalent to just require uh, embedding into the, the limit. All right, so universality means that everything can be embedded into the limit. And um, this homogeneity property means that this embedding is essentially unique. 
So if you give me, um, you fix an object and you fix two embeddings and you fix a finite set F and an epsilon, then there's an automorphism of the object that, of, the, of the limit that conjugates one embedding on, onto the other up to epsilon on the finite set F. Right, so uh, such an inductive limit with these two properties is called a regressive limit. And the theorem, as I said, is that um, this limit exists precisely when the category you're considering has these four uh, properties. And it, the limit is unique up to uh, isomorphism. Okay, so I'm gonna be telling you about two objects, as I said, that are, um, that we will construct to be first limits, which I'm calling the Brazak algebra and the Santiago algebra. Um, so Brazak algebra, I'll denote by W and the Santiago algebra by Z0. So they are both simple separable um, c star algebras with a unique tracial state, and they are steadily projections, which means that um, there are no projections in the algebras, and even when you tend to with the compact operators, there are no projections. And they also are classifiable c star algebras. They have um, one way of phrasing that is that they are finite Euclid dimension or that they are um, Z-stable. They absorb tensorially this uh, Jiangsu algebra. Z. Well, okay, maybe I, on that note, I should say. Uh, so by, um, so the Jiangsu algebra Z is also known to be a Fresse limit of a, of a suitable category. So this was proved by uh, Masumoto, who was a postdoc of um, Ilias Farah. And um, so Farah and uh, Chris Eagle and Brad Hart and some other co-authors that I can't remember right now, um, they proved that certain um, AF, approximately finite dimensional c star algebras are also uh, press elements, okay? And it's kind of the, the idea that we're working with here is that uh, so-called um, strongly self-absorbing c star algebras should be uh, Fressing limits. So these, this W and this Z0, they are by now both known to be um, uh, self-absorbing, meaning W tends to W is W and Z0 tends to Z0 is uh, Z0. Um, oh, but I'll, I'll come back to uh, comment on that um, shortly. Okay, so, uh, the, okay, blah, 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 let me um, dial it back a little bit. So these algebras W and Z0, um, one way of, Thinking about them is that they are stable projectionless analogs of the um, of Kuntz algebras. So W has the same K theory as the Kuntz algebra O2, and Z0 has the same K theory as the Kuntz algebra O infinity. Uh, and just a, a, a note, um, I'm calling this algebra the Razak algebra because W the Razak algebra is W is a, a distinguished algebra in a class of stable projectionless algebras that were classified by Shalu Brazak back in I don't know, 2000, early 2000 sometime. And I'm calling Z0 the Santiago algebra because um, Luis Santiago, to my knowledge, is the first one who constructed this uh, in some unpublished work, but he gave a talk on it in Barcelona like 10 years ago. Okay, so the current status of the classification program of, you know, focused on simple stiffly projectionless uh, C-star algebras is up to Z0 stability. So in other words, the Elliott invariant, so the Elliott invariant uh, K-theory and traces of two such algebras are isomorphic precisely when the algebras are isomorphic, isomorphic up to tensoring with this, um, this guy Z0. Uh, but if you assume further that the algebras have what's called generalized tracial rank at most one, um, then they absorb, in fact, this algebra Z0. So you get um, classification on those. Uh, this is a theorem of Elliott, Gong, Lin, and Nu. And another theorem of Elliott, Gong, Lin, Lin and Nu. If you assume the algebras, moreover, have um, trivial K theory, they are KK contractible in other words, then the classification is up to, in fact, W stability. So this is a very um, a, a strong result. Um, so, in fact, relatedly, there's a conjecture by Lionel Roberts. This is kind of why I'm just sort of explaining why these algebras are important. Um, so, conjecturally, the big class of all separable nuclear C star algebras is classified up to um, W tends to K stability by this thing that I'm calling T of A, which is the generalized tracial cone. So the, the generalized tracial cone is, um, it, it's in the sense of uh, Elliott, Roberts, and Santiago. 
uh, it includes as part of it the um, ideal, the lattice of ideals. Uh, so it's all not necessarily densely defined um, lower semi-continuous traces on the algebra. So how do how do ideals come into it? You just take the trace that is uh, you fix an ideal. You take a trace that's zero on the ideal i and infinity outside of i, and this recovers for you the um, the uh, lattice of ideals. So this um, there's some evidence for this conjecture, namely it's known to hold in the traceless, so the strongly purely infinite setting. This is essentially the uh, Kirchberg classification in that case, and um, it, it's also uh, true in the case of um, KK contractible simple Zister algebras. Uh, okay, so th that's why this guy is uh, important. All right, so those are the two algebras I'm going to construct for you as Fresse limits. So let me tell you the categories of which they are the Fresse limits. So first of all, for, for W, um, the objects, so I'll tell you the objects first. So the objects are pairs. Um, so pairs A, N, K, and Tor. So A, N, K is what I'll refer to as a Razak block, and Tor will be a faithful diffuse trace on that block. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So uh, this Razak block is an example of what's called a, a, a one-dimensional non-commutative CW complex, which means that it's of the form continuous functions from the interval into some matrix algebra with some boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions for this Razak block are on the left, so at zero, it's diagonal, bunch of um, K by K matrices down the diagonal, the, the same K by K matrix. And on the right, it's again, the same K by K matrix that appears on the left, but with a dimension drop. This, so it's a zero, one of the A's gets replaced by zero. And this dimension drop means that the um, algebra is stably projectionless. And um, you, know, you can use the six term sequence to show that it's uh, K theory is trivial. And by a, a faithful diffuse trace, I mean that um, it's, it corresponds to a faithful and diffuse probability, Borel probability measure on the interval. Um, zero one. So just given by integrating the trace of a function. Okay, so objects in the category are these pairs, Ralak block and faithful diffuse trace. So that's the, uh, those are the objects for W and the objects for Z zero are something um, very similar. Uh, so this time I'll call these generalized Ralak blocks. And again, it's pairs, generalized Ralak block and faithful diffuse trace. So the blocks look uh, similar, very um, similar description, except that um, we don't just have um, a bunch of A's and on the left and right, we have A's and B's. So we have uh, N A's and N B's at zero and N minus one A's and N minus one B's at one. Um, so again, we have this dimension drop, which again makes this a stable projectionless building block. But um, this does have some uh, K theory. The, the, the K0 group is, is Z, the K1 group is trivial. Um, sometimes this can be a bit uh, counterintuitive if you're not used to this sort of thing. Okay, like if there are no projections, how does it have K theory? Um, but you have to sort of remember that um, for non unital C through algebra, which it says, uh, K theory is defined in terms of the unitization. So you, in fact, in principle, could get any abelian group as your K0 group. Um, but, but because the serial projection has the positive cone of that K0 group is trivial. Okay, and, and again, the, the, this tall is a faithful diffuse uh, probability measure. Okay, so those are the objects for the two categories. And the morphisms are just trace preserving star homomorphisms. So, uh, Morphism from a pair, one pair to another, it's a star morphism from A to B, and it pulls back the trace tor to the trace sigma. And we require the K0, the induced map at the level of K0 to be the identity map. So for the W building blocks, there is no K theory, it's just zero. So this is not saying anything. Um, for the, the blocks that I have on this slide, the Z0, building blocks. What do I mean by the K0 is identity? I mean, you can, um, if you do the six term exact sequence, you can identify um, the actual generators of the K0 group, which is the integers. 
And by identity, I just mean it maps a generator to a generator, um, or, or you know, plus or minus generator. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Uh, by the way, so I think um, in the abstract, I wrote that not just W and Z zero, but also the tensor products of Z of Z zero with UHF algebras with infinite type are uh, trusted limits. And to get those, the, this tensor product with a UHF algebra of infinite type, um, such as the car, car algebra, for example, uh, it's the same building blocks except the, what's different is the morphisms. You just require the morphisms to divide whatever supernatural number it is that you uh, associated to the UHF algebra. Uh, by the way, um, W tends to UHF, it's just W. W is, is UHF stable because W tends to UHF has the same invariant. The K theory is, is still zero and it has a unique trace because UHF algebras have a, have a unique trace. Okay, so I won't say anything more about Z0 tensor UHF. It's the same, um, same argument. Okay, so these trace preserving uh, morphisms, they, th that's a strong enough condition to imply that they have to be uh, diagonal. So uh, by which I mean they uh, have this kind of block description. These psi i's are continuous maps from the interval to the interval. And um, U is just uh, some, um, so, well, I'll comment on this in a second. So this U, what I've written here, I guess I should have written maybe a phi F at the point T is U of T, F of Psi one of T, but U of T star. So point wise, um, this is true. Uh, but in, in fact, um, it, it's not that hard to, to show. You can uh, perturb this unitary to be continuous. So diagonal, I'm mean, meaning, just at first that the unitary happens pointwise, but you can perturb it to be continuous. Uh, okay, so, all right. Let me tell you about why we are trying to do this, why we started, why Alessandro and I started talking about this in the first place. Um, we were trying to prove that W tensor W is W. So that, that's now known to be true, but it's the proof, uh, <laughs> requires um, like the, the, some very strong, some very powerful classification results. So W tensor W and W, they both have the same invariant. They both have trivial K theory, both have unique trace. So once you have a big enough class that includes both of them, then that's it. They're, by classification, they have to be isomorphic. And that's the way it was proved by Elliot, Gong, Lin, and New. We were trying to come up with a more um, self-contained kind of naive argument. And um, one of the thoughts we had was to use um, Fresse theory. So it, uh, because the theorem I showed you uh, on the second slide was that Fresse limits, if they exist, are unique. So the idea was we would include in our Fresse category, not just these blocks A and K, but also their tensor products, A and K tensor A and L. And um, so therefore we would show that W is a fresh element and W tends to W is also a fresh element of the same class. Therefore by uniqueness, um, we would have isomorphism. Um, so this I think is uh, too much to hope for. Um, one of, so this was actually um, carried out successfully in the case of the Jiangsu algebra by uh, Said um, Gassimi. So, it's, that's essentially what Said did. I mean, he included the, so the Jiangsu algebra is built out of these prime dimension drop building blocks. So he included dimension drop blocks and the tensor products with themselves in, in the same category. And then he, he proved self-absorption that way. Uh, there are, there's a big difference between that setting and this. And the big difference is that those algebras are unital and these are non-unital. Um, so what that means is there is no obvious map from a n k to a n k tensor a n k. If you have a unit, you just send a to a tensor one or one tensor a, and these two maps are, um, are, are crucial in in arguments that prove um, z is self-absorbing. Uh, so you have no such maps um, in, in the non-unital setting. Uh, but okay, there are potentially some ways of getting around that. And we, Alessandra and I, we had a 
kind of argument based on an idea of Luis Santiago of, all right, you don't need maybe a map from a k to the full a k tends to a k. So if you think of a k lives on an interval, a k tends to a k will live on the uh, filled in square. Um, so by some kind of intertwining argument, it's in fact enough to construct maps from a and k to not the full square, but the boundary of the square. Um, and uh, we, so we were kind of able to even do this, but these, um, so I'm <laughs> finally now tying back to the point I was making at the top of the slide here. Um, in the interval setting, I said, you can perturb these unitaries to be continuous. And this turns out to be sort of, uh, an important point to make, uh, but you can't do that for these maps from a and k to the boundary of the square. Uh, there's a kind of k1 obstruction. So this circle essentially that you're mapping into has a um, non-trivial k1 class. So these unitaries that you're trying to perturb to be continuous, when you go all the way around the circle, you have a kind of overlap problem. Um, okay. Anyway, so this is just so I just wanted to tell you that our motivation was to find this proof that W tends to W is W, but I, I actually don't think it's, um, it, it's possible really. Uh, okay, right, so that's all. This in red is just what I was um, waffling on about just now. Uh, okay, right, so I've told you what the categories are, what the objects are, what the morphisms are. So now um, we need to observe that the four properties hold. So the Cauchy continuity property I told you was it's automatic for the language of tracial theta algebra, so let's not worry about it. Um, the weak Polish property, let me sort of tell you what that says. Um, so K is the, uh, the, the, the category. Um, so the objects in the category are these Raza clocks, these pairs, Raza clock and um, trace, faithful diffuse trace. And the weak Polish property is that uh, <clears throat> The if you look at again pairs where you take an object in the class K, the category K, and you take a generating set of size n, there should be at most countably many isomorphism classes as you vary uh, n over the natural numbers, right? And so that's what the weak polar property says should hold, and that is the case here. Why is that? Okay, so the pairs, um, uh, so an object is, as I said, itself a pair. Algebra, like algebra and um, uh, faithful diffuse trace. And then you look at a generating set of size n. So the only thing that could be preventing you from having countably many isomorphism classes are these traces. So potentially there are very many uh, of these Borel probability measures, uh, but there is always an automorphism of a given block that pushes one trace onto another trace, uh, if we're assuming them to be faithful and diffuse. Um, so one way you can do this is you just take the, uh, the so-called increasing rearrangement map. So it's a general fact uh, from measure theory that, that's related to the idea of optimal transport. Um, if you have two faithful diffuse uh, probability measures on the interval, you can push one onto the other. So you, you just write down the cumulative distribution functions of the measures, and then you take the inverse and compose them suitably as I've, I've written down here. And so this is a this is a homeomorphism of the interval that fixes you know the endpoints and zero to zero and one to one. And that means that it preserves uh, so it, 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 it at the level of um, spaces you have a homeomorphism. This induces uh, an isomorphism at the level of C star algebras because it preserves these endpoints. So the boundary conditions are uh, fixed. Okay, so um, this idea, this uh, increasing rearrangement map also gives us the joint embedding property. So the joint embedding property is this. If I give you two objects, so A1 sigma one and A2 sigma two here, then I should be able to find uh, morphisms that embed these two objects into a common third object. So the third object here I've, is this B lambda here. Uh, so it, it's convenient to just, I mean, it doesn't have to be, <clears throat> but I, it's convenient to just take the Lebesgue, uh, so the trace corresponding to uh, the Lebesgue measure. So in, an, um, Alessandro and I, we have a, a very extensive toolkit of um, 
concrete morphisms, star hole morphisms, trace preserving star hole morphisms between Razak blocks and generalized Razak blocks. And so our toolkit is big enough that if you give us any two, A1 and A2, we can embed them into a common fit. Okay. So the only thing that, that you have to worry about is maybe um, you know, they should pull the trace on the embedding, the algebra into which you embed it, that trace should be pulled back into the traces you, you start with. Right, so what do you do? Um, maybe that doesn't happen from the get-go. So maybe the big trace isn't pulled back to sigma one and isn't pulled back to sigma two. So it's pulled back just to some. So if the maps are phi one and phi two, it'll be pulled back to lambda composed of phi one and lambda composed of phi two. I mean, just by uh, by definition. But then you just take this increasing rearrangement map. You take an automorphism of a one and automorphism of a two that pushes. Lambda composed of phi one onto sigma one and the same for two. Okay, so this this trick also gives us this uh, joint embedding property. Okay, so at this stage we have uh, three out of the four um, properties holding. Um, so the fourth one, this near near amalgamation property, I'll get to uh, shortly. <clears throat> uh, but first, I want to tell you. So once we verify the four properties. Uh, we will construct these inductive limits within the categories, and they have to satisfy this, this universality and homogeneity properties. Um, so here's an equivalent way of thinking about that. So we're going to construct them as generic objects. So the, um, the universality is, as I, I described on the second slide, I guess, which is that if you give me an object, then it has to be embeddable into some stage of the inductive limit sequence, okay? And this is no um, great difficulty. It's just you include sufficiently many factors into the, uh, the blocks, so this n and this k, just include enough numbers so that anything fits in somewhere down the line. Um, so the interesting thing is this homogeneity property and an equivalent way of thinking about this is, so this is the, uh, I'll just refer to the diagram I have, have at the bottom here. So this is the inductive limit that we construct. And the property is this. If for some fixed i, um, you have a morphism, so a trace preserving star morphism from ai down to some algebra c, then there should be some way of going back up to some later stage of the sequence in such a way that you have um, commutativity on a given finite set up to a given epsilon um, of this data. Okay, so this is, uh, an equivalent way of thinking about the um, homogeneity property. And so this uh, version is um, proved in exactly the same way as the near amalgamation property. So really and truly, this is the, the crucial thing. So let me tell you about that now. What is the NAP, which we'll say for sure. So it's this. If you give me um, uh, an object, A sigma, so a Razak block or a generalized Razak block trace, and you give me two embeddings of that object into some A1 sigma one and A2 sigma two, and you give me a finite set F in A, and you give me a tolerance epsilon uh, bigger than zero, then I should be able to complete the diagram into some fourth object uh, V tau in such a way that it commutes up to epsilon on the, on the finite set uh, F. Okay, so if we can prove this, then um, for, uh, in, in exactly the same way you get the, the generosity of the uh, inductive limits. All right, so as um, th this is quite related uh, to a study of um, unitary orbits of star homomorphisms. Um, so this commutativity of the diagram, uh, it's equivalent to require commutativity up to F and epsilon and up to conjugation by some unitary. Because conjugating by a unit tree doesn't happen. So, uh, can, can, can this B tau here be any tracial C star algebra? Is there a restriction on what B has to be? Does it have to be well, like to be in the category? So, so, if we're talking about the category KW, it should be a Razak block and a faithful diffuse. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But, but good question. Yeah. Um, okay. So, in fact, what we'll do is we'll get uh, commutativity up to F epsilon up to conjugating by some uh, unit tree. So another way of saying that is the, the unitary orbits of this composed, so this, this star morphism at the top, this composition with the solid line and the dot line at the top, 
let's call that phi and let's call the bottom one psi. So the unit trig orbits of phi and psi should be uh, the, the, unit, the distance between the unit trig orbits of phi and psi measured with respect to this finite set f should be the most epsilon. Um, so just as a, as a okay, th this idea of studying unitary orbits is, is a long story one, um, as, as I'm, you know, I'm sure you all know. Uh, so I just want to give as a prototypical result in this kind of um, direction, this result of myself and, and Karen Strong and Andrew Toms, which is that in the, <clears throat> so in a simple topical, let's say exact sister algebra that absorbs uh, this junk. So algebra Z, uh, and any two positive contractions that don't have any spectral gaps, then the distance between the uh, unitary orbits can be measured tracially. So the requirement that they don't have spectral gaps, gaps so that you don't have to talk about uh, K theory. Um, so, okay, more specifically, when I write DU here, I mean that uh, it, it's exactly as I, as I said, the distance between the unitary orbits. You look at all unitary conjugates of, let's say, B, and you look at the distance between that and A, you take them in And this that I've denoted delta is, um, okay, you take, you look at all, all traces on the algebra. So the reason I want exact here is that I, we can talk about traces and not positive traces. Um, so you look at all traces on the algebra, and every trace restricts to a trace on the C-star algebra generated by your positive elements A and B. Uh, so that means they give you, um, measures on, on the spectra, okay? And then you look at uh, what you might call the optimal matching distance between um, these measures on spectra. So uh, I'll, I tell you um, what I mean specifically by that here. So this delta between two measures uh, is, okay, all right, let us maybe not harp on this so much. It's you look at all open sets and you look at how much you need to enlarge. So this UR that I have here, it's the R neighborhood, the points of a, a distance of most R from you. So how much you need to enlarge open sets to dominate one measure by the other. Um, okay, so in, in, the, in the paper where I, you know, uh, study this particular distance with Andrew and Karen, uh, we called it the levy proper of distance, but it's not actually the levy proper of distance. Um, so levy proper of, would be uh, if I had not just, a, let's say, a new of this UR on the right-hand side here, but if I had a plus R as well on the right-hand side. So this is a, um, a larger distance than the levy proper of distance. And um, in fact, what it is, it's the infinity versus time distance. Um, as you know, people who study geometric measure theory would be probably more familiar um, than I was at the time. Um, uh, but, you know, all this to say, it, it does in general give you a, uh, a finite topology than the weak star topology. So the levy proper of distance actually does give you the weak star topology. This infinity versus time doesn't, unless you restrict to uh, measures with um, which have no, um, which have no atoms. It, but it, it turns out it's the right notion to look at in the context of c star algebra. Uh, okay, anyway, so also, uh, on, so on the previous side, I said that this du was the same as this delta, and it's also the same as this dw. dw is what um, I'll call the Kuntz distance. Uh, so it's defined in a very similar way to this delta at the top here, um, except in terms of what's called Kuntz uh, sub-equivalence instead of in terms of measures. So, I, but I won't get into the nitty gritty of that. But just think that um, if you have, if you're talking about just matrices. This Kuntz distance really just boils down to the uh, the distance, the optimal matching distance between the eigenvalues of the matrix. And if you are talking about not just um, you know point matrices, but uh, continuous um, functions of matrices, then it's you can think of it as the pointwise, but not think it it does boil down to the pointwise distance between the uh, eigenvalues of the, of the matrices. Uh, okay. Right, so we're working our way to showing, um, we're proving the near amalgamation property and I just like to think about it in terms of unitary orbits. Um, so here is a result along heading in that direction. Um, this is essentially due to uh, Thompson some time ago back in the early nineties or something. 
Um, but just it, it it's phrased this way in terms of unitary orbits. Um, okay, but anyway, this is just a nice way of, of looking at it. All right. So let's say the domain is uh, continuous functions from the interval into n some n by n matrices. So it's it's like one of these one dimensional long period of CW complexes without the uh, boundary conditions. All right, but B, the codomain is genuinely a one dimensional long period of CW complex. It's allowed to have boundary conditions. Then if you give me any two uh, diagonal style morphisms from A to B, uh, you know, diagonal meaning, you know, has this block diagonal uh, description, then the unitary distance and the Kuntz distance, they coincide to okay. What do I mean? Um, so I defined for you a couple of slides ago the, what I meant by the unitary distance between two fixed elements. Here I have between two star homomorphisms, which is what we want for the yeah, approximation property. And it's a kind of just a uniform, uniformized version of that over. So we're measuring it here with respect to one Lipschitz functions. So you look at all um, continuous functions from the interval to the n by n matrices that are one Lipschitz. So the norm distance between f of x and f of y is at the most the distance between uh, x and y. Okay, and then you take um, the, you, you see how far apart the unit, the images under phi and psi uh, of the one Lipschitz functions are, are after conjugating by, by unitaries. Okay, so that's what I mean by the unitary distance. And it, by the Kuhn's distance, let's just think about it as the, uh, the distance between eigenvalues. Um, of all of these uh, one Lipschitz functions. Okay, so these these coincide. And as it is essentially a result due to Thompson. All right, so uh, this is almost what we want. The only thing is that the domain is, you know, the, it's not a Rallick lock, but a generalized Rallick lock, but it's continuous functions from the interval to n by n matrices. Uh, but the good news is that um, it, our uh, domains of interest can be reduced to this case. So Lionel Roberts, uh, 10 years ago or something, um, he classified uh, star homomorphisms from, uh, who, from the domain, domains um, one-dimensional non commutative CW complexes, as long as uh, you have trivial K1. And the way he did this is a combinatorial reduction. So every such block, so in particular, a Razak block or a generalized Razak block or dimension drop algebra, prime dimension drop algebra. Um, it can be reduced step by step to just continuous functions on the interval by, you do one of three things. You can add a unit, you can remove a unit, or you can do a stabilized morphism. Um, uh, and in, in fact, this, so the stabilized morphism is a very concrete kind of stabilized morphism. It's just, um, for example, uh, inflating or deflating a point at infinity. So this, for example, a Razak block. So this is the thing that, at zero was a bunch of A's, and at one was a bunch of A's, one less A. Um, this has one point at infinity. So each A is, is a point at infinity. Um, so when I say inflating or deflating a point at infinity, so the A lives in K by K matrices, maybe you want to inflate it to 2K by 2K matrices or deflate it to the complex numbers, that sort of thing. It is, um, so just doing a sequence of these steps, you get from the algebra we want we reduce it down to the uh, just continuous functions on the interval. And then, um, so, and then you can just kind of chase the Thompson results through this sequence of steps. So we measure, um, so the Thompson result was measuring with respect to the one Lipschitz functions. And then you just see where that um, set, that reference set goes to under the sequence of steps. And then you measure the, the unitary distance and the Kuhn's distance relative to this, um, this, uh, let's call it G. Uh, and, um, and again, if you, if you chase down this sequence of steps, what you get is that the, the unitary distance, okay, you know, I would ideally like it, what I'm particularly interested in kind of in general is showing that these distances are equal, but what's good enough for proving it, the, the NAP is at least showing that they're uniformly continuous. So there's some function H, which just depends upon the sequence of steps. And you can bound this unitary distance and this Kuhn's distance, you know, by this this function h. Okay. So and then a, a corollary of that is that we we get the nap. Um, here's how that works. Uh, oh, so we need to um, 
okay, we're given this A sigma, and this A1 sigma one and A2 sigma two, and we need to complete the diagram. So what we do is we first complete the diagram using our tool toolkit of maps in such a way that we have agreement on K theory and traces. And then we, again, continue using our toolkit to map from the preliminary stage into some further subsequent stage uh, by maps that have very, very small um, diameter. So these maps, these psi eyes that appear in the diagonal decomposition should have very, very, very tiny diameter. And um, if you unpack all of this, what this is telling you, um, you have agreement on K-theory and traces, very, very small diameter. Uh, effectively, what we get is that the Kuntz distance is tiny, as small as we like. So it's uh, less than delta, where delta is small enough by this uniform continuity to guarantee that the unitary distance is um, at most epsilon. All right. So that gives us the, the, the nap. We've completed the, the diagram. Uh, and then, so, um, and as I said, once we have the nap, similar sort of arguments, we'll get uh, generosity of these, um, of the Fresse limits. So we get that W is the unique Fresse limit of its category in Z0 of its. Um, so just remark in, in passing, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of interested most more in the case where we have on the nose equality of the distances. And I think it, it should in fact be true that this, this function H that appears here should just be the identity. And, that, and that's kind of something that I'm uh, working on. This is work in progress. Um, showing the quality of unitary distances and Kuhn's distances of star homomorphisms measured with respect to relative to suitable uh, reference sets of, of one Lipschitz functions. Um, okay, so in progress. Um, all right, maybe I'll just kind of skip over this. Uh, so I, I mentioned that the, um, the, this optimal, this delta mu mu, this thing that is kind of like, but not quite the levy proper of distance. Um, what it actually is, is the infinity Wasserstein distance. So all I'm saying here on this, this slide here is that, you know, there are WP, there are P Wasserstein distances where P can be anything from one to infinity. And you can do all of this um, except relative to this, this WP instead of um, W infinity. And um, you, you get a Fresse theory, uh, except it won't be in terms of, of, of c star algebra, it would be in terms of what are called non commutative uh, LP spaces. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so finally, I will just say a um, couple of potential applications. So the, the first one, as I said, our motivation was to prove that uh, we have self absorption of these things. And, um, oh, right, I just, somehow I was thinking that my time was up at, uh, at uh, now, essentially, but oh, okay, that's good, that's fine, okay, um, anyway. Um, all right, so as I was saying, the uh, status is, um, I, I don't, I, I, I'm dubious that this will be um, doable. It, it just seems that there are uh, substantial obstacles to this, um, but something that I'm kind of more, uh, hopeful about is um, extreme amenability. Um, so there is a connection between uh, Fresse theory and extreme amenability um, via, via Ramsey theory. So this is something called the approximate Ramsey property. So it's some combinatorial thing that in theory can be checked. And it's known that uh, if you have a Fresse limit, then it's bottom morphism group in the, the suitable weak topology, so I guess the point norm, the topology of point norm conversions um, is uh, extremely amenable, uh, if and only if you have this approximate Ramsey property, okay? So it, it's, um, but, but I don't know that to, to date, this has actually been used in, in C-star algebras to demonstrate extreme amenability. Um, so maybe you know, uh, you know, uh, Gromov and Milman, and then also Giordano and Pastov, they studied uh, extreme amenability of the various automorphism groups using um, concentration measure techniques. And um, in this paper by, uh, by Ilias and Chris Eagle and, and, and co authors, um, they also, just by a kind of easy concentration argument, demonstrate uh, extreme amenability of the automorphism groups of these AF algebras that they consider. 
And then they observe that because of this equivalence that these algebras, these Fresse limits have this approximate Ramsey property. Uh, but, but, you know, the more interesting thing is probably the other way around, you know, uh, demonstrating the Ramsey property and then deducing extreme readability. And I, I, I don't know um, if this has been really done so much in the, in the C star world. Um, so I, as far as I know, it's an open question whether the automorphism group of, for example, the Jiangsu algebra is extremely amenable. And um, the question also uh, stands for W and uh, for Z0. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, this is something I would like to think about. Um, okay, but that is all I have to say. So, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, Bishan. Uh, do you have any questions, Bishan? Um, can you briefly say again how you're using this Wasserstein metric? Right. So you're using it to compare it to the unit distance of the unitary orbit? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, X plus oh, okay. It, it just gets kind of sandwiched in between the two <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, it's just, I, I, I because it's get, it gets kind of sandwiched, I just thought it would be uh, maybe a little more accessible to <laughs> write down this definition than perhaps the, the Kuntz. So, so the, D, the DWAB here, is that like the... So it that's is... That's the actual Wasserstein metric of these two elements. Right, yeah, sorry. So the, the DWAB is this... Uh, Kuntz distance. Ah, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, the fine. W here is for the Kuntz semigroup uh, W. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, what what I, I guess what I said here was right. Um, what you can do, it, it, it's two different. Uh, kind of argument. So if you want, you can, the argument for that theorem that I showed you with myself and then Andrew and Carl um, kind of used in a very crucial way, the Kuntz semigroup and Kuntz semigroup techniques. And we kind of just got this uh, infinity Wasser sign distance kind of sandwiched in between the two. Uh, but you can argue, you can kind of forget about the Kuntz distance and you can just um, argue in terms of the, this actual measure theoretic Distance um, using basically this uh, this this increasing re rearrangement map, mm -hmm. um, uh, just to push one measure onto the other. And th this map is so well behaved that you can bound um, you can so if two measures are let's say W P distance apart, then the the norm distance between the homeomorphism H that pushes one onto the other. And the identity, so the distance between that map and the identity is at most this WP distance. Um, so, so you can kind of use that idea to show what I've written here: this equality between the the, the P unitary distance and the this WP uh, distance. Um, yeah. So, but it, it's it, it's kind of a different depending on your point of view whether you want to go by the Kuntz or the, the measure theoretic. Because I'm, I'm wondering whether um, you can, I mean, maybe it's, it's too vague, but whether any of this makes sense in sort of more free, free probabilistic context, because uh -huh. there you also have a, you know, there's like a non-commutative Wasserstein distance um, more generally for sort of like non-commutative distributions. Um, and there's a few things you can say about that. And also this, Near, you know, this near amalgamation property. If you, you know, if you're in the free probabilistic context, there are these amalgamated free products, so it becomes an exact amalgamation property. Ah, yeah. uh, and so I'm wondering if, like, there must be some way to realize, like, I don't know, the full Caesar algebra, or sorry, the yeah, maybe the full or reduced Caesar algebra of f infinity with the the trace coming from from the left regular or something. Um, no, no. As, a, as some fresh a limit um yeah that's okay that's an excellent point yeah um, yeah i I'm, I'm, i hmm, i wonder if i'm not to that i'm gonna i make a note of that it's a good point
yeah, but I mean, it, it's not something that I've thought about to, to be to be honest with you. But but yeah, um, it just it just got me to thinking during the talk. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Cool. Yeah, I'll we'll definitely have a think about that. I was going to ask about um, spectral matching distance where you don't do positive elements, but maybe you do normal elements. And so in n by n matrices, these are not equal, but yeah. they are close to being equal. And there's a constant nobody knows. Yeah. Um, and so if you're trying to do this in a C star algebra, I'm wondering if you get in your context, I guess the same constants, or is it is it interesting possibly if you had a C star algebra where you could show that they're related, but maybe with a worse constant? Um, yeah. So this is very much something that uh, that um, I'm, I'm kind of actively thinking about. So I have this paper with Karen and Alessandro where we were motivated by uh, extending not just you know not to the full class of normal elements, but at least maybe to cover unitaries, um, for example. Uh, and this is where this idea of including optimal transport kind of um, arose. Like we. we for, we took, looked at measures on the circle and pushed one onto the other. Depending on how far we need to push them, this kind of told us about the distance between the unitary orbits. Um, and then, so what I've been thinking is maybe uh, there might be, depending upon the space that your, you know, that your spectra live on, there might be um, the, the constant might be adaptable to the space. So there might be something like a, a transport constant of the space which would give you uh, different inequalities. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my question. I wonder yeah, if yeah, yeah. It's, it's a It's a good question. But I think, um, so this kind of constant that you get, uh, so I mean, I guess there is one, you know, also for uh, for um, semi-finite von Neumann factors, I, I guess. Uh, maybe it's even the same constant that appears in the matrix. I believe it's the same as far as anybody knows. Right, right, yeah. Um, and, and the only, I mean, the estimates are, there aren't very many calculations. There's a paper by Holbrook where he does some computations and just reports that yeah. <laughs> not one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I, I, I think this is a, a you know, very interesting. So I, I think, uh, so, and kind of like, um, you know, maybe you're not just interested in fixed elements where the spectra are, you know, correspond to subsets of the plane, but you're looking at star morphisms from billions of these algebras. So then you could think of maybe higher dimensional kind of topological objects. So I, I think, for example, if you have something like a, a compact connected Riemannian manifold of dimension at least two, then um, suitably defined unitary distances and the these distances between measures are in fact equal to the constants should be like one in this setting for reasons like optimal transport kind of reason. Well, you know, with some K theoretic restrictions. Yeah, but um, mm -hmm. uh, but but okay, but anyway, definitely something I'm actively thinking about. Do we have any other questions for Bishop? I, I was just going to ask whether the the near amalgamation property has to be a near amalgamation property, or could it be a joint amalgamation property that you can hit it on the nose and you just didn't you don't have to for to satisfy the conditions of the theorem? But do you know that you can't hit it on the nose? Yeah, this. I mean, I my I, I don't know that I <laughs> I don't know that it's impossible. I guess. Uh, um, But I, I, I strongly suspect that you, you, it kind of needs to be near uh, in this setting. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel almost certain that it has to be, but I, I, I couldn't <laughs> definitively tell you. OK, 
Okay, there are no more questions. Let me just stop the recording.